evening my dear colleagues today we'll talk about an important cause of polyuria uh, in our patients which is diabetes insipidus this is our agenda before we talk about diabetes insipidus we should talk first about an important hormone in our body which is the vasopressin known as arginine vasopressin AVB or the antidiuretic hormone antidiuretic hormone which controls the excretion of water from our body through its, its action on the renal collecting system from its name it is called antidiuretics antidiuretic hormone antidiuretic hormone so it keeps the water in our body so it causes antidiuresis so it keeps the water in our body in our body in response to any change in the tonicity or the osmolality in our body when there is increased osmolarity or decreased blood volume there is sensation by the receptors that we should keep water in our body because there is increased concentration of sodium for example or decreased blood volume so we need fluid we should keep the water in our body so there is increased secretion of the antidiuretic hormone or the vasopressin to keep the water in our body from the kidney the antidiuretic hormone or the vasopressin is synthesized and secreted from the hypothalamus how this arginine vasopressin or the AVB or the antidiuretic hormone acts in the kidney what is its mechanism of action as we see here this is the renal uh, tubular cell this is the basolateral membrane and this is the apical membrane which is the lumen the lumen of the renal tubule so it acts in the other side in the basolateral membrane the endolytic hormone will bind to its receptor which is uh, we have two types of receptor vasopressin one and two one uh, there is one a and one b the main receptor in the renal tubular cells is the vasopressin two receptor don't forget this the vasopressin acts on the v2 receptors in the kidney this will cause increased level of cyclic amb increased level so cyclic amb is important for the action of the avb v2 receptor increased cyclic amb and this will cause phosphorylation and more synthesis and movement of the aquaborin two channels aquaborin two channel aquaborin channel is the water channel so the aquaporin 2 channels will move to the apical membrane causing the water to be to go back from the lumen to inside the kidney to the interstitium so at the end the vasopressin causes the water to go back so it's from its name antidiuretic hormone so the vasopressin or the AVB for its accent action we need the vasopressin 2 receptor we need cyclic AMB and we need aquaborin 2 so what is diabetes insipidus diabetes insipidus is the disease caused by a defect or when there is abnormality in the AVB or the antidiuretic hormone or the vasopressin action either due to abnormality in the senses in the senses from the hypothalamus or the brain so it is called central diabetes insipidus or when the secretion is adequate or normal but it cannot act in the kidney which is the main site for its action when there is resistance in the kidney to the action of the AVB, so it is called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. In both conditions, the antidiuretic hormone will not act appropriately. It will not get, uh, cause the water to go back, so the water will be lost in the urine. There is increased water in the kidney, causing the main manifestations or the main clinical feature, which is polyuria, severe polyuria and polydipsy. Now we'll talk about the central diabetes and as we said, 
central diabetes insipid is due to defective or decreased antidiuretic hormone synthesis and secretion from the brain, so it's called central, so it is mainly central causes. It might be due to congenital cause autosomal dominant form, or it might be autosomal recessive, and it can be associated with diabetes mellitus in a syndrome called Wolfram syndrome. But the most important is acquired causes for uh, causing decreased EDH secretion and sense in the brain might be due to post-traumatic, iatrogenic post-surgical, tumors, as in the hypothalamus, or from the posterior pituitary, the EDH is synthesized in the hypothalamus, but it, it is uh, uh, stored and secreted from the posterior pituitary. So any tumors uh, like metastasis from the breast or tumor like craniopharyngioma or uh, benyloma. Uh, granulomas, especially tuberculosis and sarcoid. Sarcoid is an important cause for diabetes insipidus. Aneurysm, meningitis, encephalitis, glian, drugs, and idiopathic central diabetes insipidus or defective EDH secretion might be due to idiopathic cause. And idiopathic diabetes insipidus is idiopathic central diabetes insipidus is the most common cause, causing about 50% of the cases are due to. Uh, idiopathic form. What about the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? As we said before, nephrogenic is a, here the secretion of the EDH from the brain is adequate. Is adequate, but there is abnormality in the kidney, so the EDH cannot work appropriately. This nephrogenic diabetes insipidus due to kidney affection might be the congenital or acquired congenital due to mutation, as we said, in the V2 receptor or the aquaporin 2 channels. Any abnormality in these two uh, uh, areas will cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. What are the common acquired causes for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? And this cause is very important and are very frequently asked for in the exam. Chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, especially tubal interstitial affection, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, sickle cell disease, protein malnutrition, demyclocycline, lithium, lithium, and pregnancy. And this table shows what is the mechanism, the mechanism for each cause of these to affect the action of the antidiuretic hormone, either due to abnormality in the interstitial tonicity or abnormality in cyclic AMB. As we said in the graph earlier, the AVB or the antidiuretic hormone to work appropriately, we need the V2 receptor, we need the cyclic AMB, we need the aquaborin 2 channel. And, or it might be due to aquaborin affection. So each cause, this table illustrates what is the mechanism for each one of them? In pregnancy, there is increased vasopressinase enzyme, which goes, which of course from its name, it uh, attacks the vasopressin hormone. But from these causes, what is the most important cause of nephrogenic diabetes and cibidus? The most common cause is lithium, lithium therapy. Lithium therapy is the most common cause of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Usually, usually nephrogenic diabetes in, uh, or the diabetes insipidus, either central or nephrogenic, usually present by hypernatremia. Hypernatremia, as we said in the previous video about hypernatremia, uh, it is mainly due to increased water loss causing aovolemia the most important cause is diabetes insipidus. So keep in mind in any patient with hypernatremia, keep diabetes insipidus in your differential diagnosis. To diagnose, to diagnose, these patients with diabetes insipidus, the main clinical presentation is bulyuria and bulidipsia. Bulyuria and bulidipsia due to the defect in the AVB action. But 
to differentiate, we should differentiate between central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and primary polydipsy. This is very important because the three conditions present by the same manifestations, which is polyuria and polydipsy. How we can differentiate between these three conditions? We do what is called water deprivation test. Water deprivation test. The water intake is restricted from the patient until the patient loses 3 to 5% of body weight or until three consecutive hourly urine osmolarity are within 10% of each other. So the urine osmolarity uh, will be calculated each hour and when it is uh, the corrections is 10% of each other so we should stop and after that we can give the aqueous vasopressin five units subcutaneously and the urine osmolality is measured after 60 percent now we'll discuss to differentiate first the primary polydipsia primary polydipsia is a psychological problem when the patient in uh, uh, intakes a lot huge amount of water when the patient intake huge amount takes in a huge amount of water this will cause increased urine so it is called primary polydipsy here in this table we should differentiate between the central central diabetes insipidus which might be complete or partial central diabetes insipidus the problem is defective secretion of uh, L AVB, L L arginine vasopressin or the EDF, there is defective secretion and this defective secretion might be complete complete deficiency or either partial deficiency of secretion or might be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Here the EDH is secretion is adequately but the problem is with its action in the kidney, the problem in the kidney there is resistance or primary polydipsia, due, which is due to increased intake of water. Of course, in patients or in the three conditions, in the three conditions where there, there is defective uh, action of the AVB, there is increased bulyuria, there is increased amount of urine, increased water in urine, causing the urine osmolality to be low because it is diluted this urine is diluted due to the huge amount of water the first step to differentiate between the three conditions is to do the water deprivation test water deprivation test when we restrict the water intake from patient with primary polydipsia this is the abnormality the abnormality in patient with primary polydipsia is due to increased water intake. So when we restrict the water, we stop the water intake, then the urine osmolality will, will go high because the urine will be concentrated. We correct the problem. The problem is the increased water intake and then we stop it. So, so the urine osmolality will be high and then we exclude patient with primary polydipsia very early with water deprivation test but in patient with diabetes and either central, uh, central or nephrogenic the urine osmolality will remain low will remain will remain low because we don't correct the problem the problem is not in the water intake so we go for the next step we inject the patient, we should measure the serum vasopress. We should measure the serum level of vasopress to differentiate between central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we said the, the level of the vasopressin is adequate, so it will be more than 5 picogram per milli. But in central diabetes insipidus, it will be low. 
because in central it is due to the effective secretion. In complete central, it, it is undetectable, but in partial central, it is less than 1.5. To confirm, so we exclude, we diagnose the patient with nephrogenic deletion cells by the serum vasopressin in the, in the second step. In the third step, we need to confirm diagnosis of central diabetes insipidus in patient with central diabetes insipidus. As we said, in central diabetes insipidus, the problem is with the defective secretion. There is a very low amount of antidiuretic hormone. So we'll give the patient exogenous vasopressin. We give the patient exogenous vasopressin or its synthetic analog, the desmobras. We give vasopressin exogenous. And then we will measure the urine osmolarity because we correct the, the abnormal condition here. We give the vasopressin. So when we give the external vasopressin, the urine osmolality will go high because this exogenous vasopressin will act in the kidney causing water uh, to go back, water reabsorption, and the urine osmolality, the urine will be concentrated and the urine osmolality, as we see here, will be increased after the administration of vasopressin. So, to conclude, primary polydipsia will be diagnosed with water deprivation as the urine osmolality will go high. In the next step, we measure the serum vasopressin, which will be high in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, but it will be very low in central cases. In central cases, to confirm your diagnosis, you should give external or exogenous vasopressin or desmopressin, and then the urine osmolality will be high. To treat, what is the treatment of the central diabetes insipidus? As we said, in central, there is defective synthesis of antidiuretic hormones, so the, of course the treatment will be a replacement. We should replace the hormone. We should replace the hormone by giving the vasopressin or the, the more commonly now to give its long-acting synthetic analog, which is the desmopressin. Desmopressin is given in complete central or partial central diabetes insipidus. Desmopressin can be given intranasally or orally in a dose of 10 to 20 uh, 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 microgram intranasally, or it is either 0.1 to 0.8 milligram orally, or in partial central, as we see here, we can give the desmopressin intranasal, or we can give the vasopressin subcutaneously, or we can give drugs that can potentiate the release or the action of the uh, vasopressin, uh, which are the most commonly carbamazepine and chlorpromamide. So in central, we give the replacement. What about in hypernatremia or in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? As we see here, this is our focus. Diabetes insipidus usually can present by eovolemic uh, hypernatremia. We should correct the hypernatremia by giving 5% dextrose or oral water. In central diabetes insipidus, we should give the desmopressin or the vasopressin. Long-term therapy, as we said, in central diabetes insipidus, we should give the desmopressin uh, intranasal or, or oral uh, uh, plus carbamazepine. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we should correct the drugs or we should stop in lithium. And we can give thiazide diuretics and amyloride in lithium in the used cases because the amyloride will prevent the lithium from entering the cells. And if the patient has hypokalemia or hypercalcemia, we should correct the hypokalemia and hypercalcemia. This is our sources, and thank you.